blistering cold to freeze a person to death, meager rations of stale bread, the violent danger of hardened criminals at every turn, and no contact with the outside world. These are just some of the conditions faced in the infamous labor camps of Arctic Siberia. Welcome to Bizarre History. Today, we're going to look at the day-to-day -day life of prisoners interned in the Soviet Gulag. The term gulag has become a little weakened over time. Modern usage of the term probably indicates a prison of undesirable conditions. Now, that's not a bad starting point for what we're talking about, but it isn't the entire truth. The gulag was a system invented by Vladimir Lenin in the 1920s following World War I. Its actual birth was not the naming of the places or locations, but a government agency set up to implement forced labor in networks of camps. In English, gulag is the term for all forced labor camps found in Russia, where they were used as tools of political oppression and no more so than under the rule of Joseph Stalin. In the 1920s, the population of the gulags grew as high as 100,000 people. Come the late 1940s, as many as 1.4 million people would have been interned. It's been estimated as many as 14 million people would have passed through the system before its dismantling under Khrushchev. The figures are still open to debate, but it's been estimated as many as 1.6 million people died in the gulags. Part of the reason for the debate is the practice of releasing prisoners close to death with illness or exhaustion. The true figure may never be known. Upon arriving at the labor camp, the conditions ahead for the interned varied depending on their site and reasons for sentencing. For example, a gulag containing lifetime criminals and political prisoners would see it guarded with guard towers and machine guns, and all barracks were locked. Yet other accounts of camps containing non-political prisoners speak of negligible surveillance and mattresses with pillows. There are also varying accounts of how much correspondence a prisoner was permitted according to their crime. Some interning at the Gulag had unlimited correspondence. Political prisoners faced only two to three letters in a single year. What any and every prisoner was guaranteed in correspondence was it being inspected and censored to the liking of the guard prisoners. Let this not give the impression that none of the above did not contain penal labor. This was forced labor riddled in Lenin's maxim. To everyone according to their needs, from everyone according to their abilities. But this saying on the ground of Russia had taken a very different translation. Ne robayet ne kusyat. If you don't work, you don't eat. Rations were handed out accordingly. The order of the day was productivity, and accounts of memoirs include witnessing prisoners made to work for three days without eating. It should also be said, a majority of these labor camps were spread across Siberia, often as far as up into the Ural Mountains. The weather conditions would regularly hit minus 30 degrees Celsius. When the weather hit minus 40, they stopped working, and when there was no work to be done, then nobody would eat. In a nutshell, Russia was behind many industrialized capitalist countries. The interwar period was notorious for wide-held fears of the next war, rightly so if you ask me. Many great Western powers at the time, like Great Britain, had cut all diplomatic ties with Russia and had held territory on Russian soil during its civil war. Following his succession of Lenin, Joseph Stalin was soon the Soviet premier and had a grand vision of how to take Russia out from behind its capitalist rivals and potentially pull ahead. The five-year plan was the totalitarian approach to a new deal, if you will. For Russia to make leaps of development in its industry, it had to take grand measures to make them happen. One of the keys to this was the collectivization of agriculture, which took all privately owned land and farming and brought it to larger state-owned collective farms. This was all in the name of progress and didn't go down without a fight. Kulaks, as peasant farmers were known, were hardly of a mind to give up their life's work. In response, the Kulaks were soon propagandized as enemies of the Russian state, alleged to be hoarding produce for their profit at the expense of Russia's development. 
Deculicization was a period where many of the peasant class were rounded up and interned. Not coincidentally, during this period of collectivization, the Gulag faced an influx of people arriving. While the crushing of the Kulaks is often seen as Stalin's first wave of terror upon the Russian people, the interning of people into the Gulag is not far behind. Part of what made Stalin's rule so potent was bending the law to suit his means and bear no consequence. By the time Stalin got hold of Lenin's Gulag framework, he was able to legally simplify any procedure that would slow internment. The NKVD, precursor to the KGB, was granted special troikas. These NKVD troikas were the legal means to have three government officials conduct investigations and deliver a sentence without a court, judge, or trial in sight. This off-the-books form of governing suited the initial version for the Gulag. For Lenin, the Gulag was always a political tool. These camps were meant for those not in line, subversive or disruptive to the communist cause. In other words, anyone that Stalin and the Communist Party didn't take a liking to was vulnerable to ending up in a forced labor camp. With the Troikas, the list was endless. War criminals, prisoners of war, petty criminals, and political prisoners could all be sentenced to be interned at a moment's notice. Even jokes made at the expense of the Soviet officials could result in imprisonment. The mixing of serious hardened criminals with a comparatively innocent prison population was intentional. Those watching the running of the Gulag knew that fear and its implementation would keep all parties in line. As many as half of the Gulag population were sentenced without a fair trial. People could expect government officials showing up at their door in the dead of night, out in a marketplace in the morning, at their place of work. Vulnerability was permanent and immovable. They would be loaded up onto cattle trains in mass and sent to the remote campsite by the tens of thousands. These cattle car journeys crammed in thousands of people for what would have been weeks on end to reach the far reaches of Arctic Siberia. Each train cart would be closed from the outside with just a bucket of soup between an entire packed cart. Survival of such a journey was not guaranteed. It was more than likely counted on that many wouldn't. There are several accounts from Polish prisoners of war sent to the Gulag following the split from Poland between Russia and Germany at the start of World War II. Under the NKVD, perfectly innocent Poles taken from their homeland would have been granted the special status of social criminals. They were sent to the Great White Bear, as the Gulag was colloquially known, and were not expected to return. From Polish accounts, the gravity of lived conditions in the Gulag is chillingly outlined. Dying was not so much a daily, but a potentially hourly experience. The bottom of the hierarchy for those in the Gulag were those near death. They had two nicknames in Russian. Vitili, meaning wick, as in that of a candle shortly to be blown out. Often the Russians referred to these prisoners as Dokhyodachi, which derives from a verb meaning to reach the end. The Dokhyodachi were in the Western parlance donors, the slow deterioration of the Dokhyodachi would be clear for all to see, starting with skin sores and the loosening of teeth. Their afflictions would be numerous from malnutrition and vitamin deficiencies. Riddled with scurvy, pellagra, and diarrhea, would soon face the loss of sight in darkness. Many Dokhyodachi would be seen fluttering their hands out before them in the earliest of dark mornings. These forgotten once people would spend their last days out of any form of human interaction, feeding on whatever came before them, the carcasses of birds, dogs, even garbage. As the death grip of the gulag took hold, their skin would loosen, their eyes would take on a mad, glassy shine. They would rant and rave, losing control of their bodily functions. They lost their humanity. If you want more of history's harshest settings and bravest of survivors, hit subscribe, like, and ring that notification bell. Thanks for watching Bizarre History. We'll see you next time.